We start with a single cell, a stem cell. And when that cell enters our research network all over the world, it becomes the most powerful tool we have in medical research today. Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Gala and Science Fair of the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and it is my pleasure to return this year as your host for this exciting program. And over the next hour, as we celebrate science, we're gonna learn about the exciting research that's being done by NYSEF scientists, and we're gonna celebrate the 2021 stem cell heroes as well. As we've seen throughout this past year and a half, the pursuit and success of cutting edge medical research is ubiquitously urgent for the entire world. And as we continue to navigate this pandemic, science continues to offer us our best hope for tackling so many of the challenges of today, as well as the unknowns of tomorrow, from not only COVID-19, but all the diseases that affect us and our loved ones. The theme tonight is show up for science. So thank you for joining us as we explore how NYSEF is using stem cells for better understanding diseases, for discovering new and better drugs, and for developing new technologies like automated robotics and harnessing artificial intelligence to accelerate research toward better treatments and cures for some of the most devastating diseases of our time. Now throughout the program, the names of tonight's supporters will be scrolling across the bottom of the screen if you donate during the event, your name will also be added to the scroll. So I hope you will go to nicef.org slash donate and donate now to add your name to that list as well. And to that end, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize this evening's sponsors for championing NYSEF. NYSEF's pioneering work would not be possible without that critical and generous support. So thank you for showing up for science with us. And now to get us started, I'd like to welcome the CEO and founder of the NYSEF Research Institute, who has built this organization over the past 16 years, a wonderful and determined woman, someone who has become a friend, Susan Solomon. Hey, Susan, so great to see you again. Thank you so much for hosting us. You know, when I, when I learned about what you do, I found so interesting because when you think of nonprofits, you think about giving out grants, but you also do your own research, which yes. I thought was really fascinating. Can you talk a bit about why that is? Of course. Um, when we started 16 years ago, uh, stem cell science was really just in its infancy. And our goal was to use this amazing you know, window into a living human being in order to accelerate treatments and cures for the people that we love. Um, and to try to move the research from, from bench to bedside um, in a much faster way uh, than we possibly could. Um, and we began by actually giving out grants and so forth. And we've created an incredible community of uh, over 200 uh, brilliant scientists. These are the people who are creating gene editing. They've created the mRNA that has enabled these unbelievable vaccines uh, that is going to rid us of this uh, horrible pandemic. But there are bottlenecks that were not being handled by either the existing uh, way that research is done or technology that simply didn't exist that we had to create. So we now have, in addition to the 200 scientists around the world uh, that we support, um, we have a large laboratory. I think it's the largest stem cell laboratory uh, in the country, which you visited. And we're able to create uh, all different kinds of, uh, of stem cells from uh, really, literally, it could be anyone that's, that's watching tonight. Hmm. Yeah, I, it's fascinating work, no question. But I'm wondering if you can talk more about that, that last point. I mean, we typically hear about research happening at universities, the NIH, pharmaceutical companies, many different groups that are all working to find new therapies for these, some of these diseases. You're, you, you describe it as a bottleneck. Why aren't they doing that work? How is the Stem Cell Foundation different? Well, it's a, it's a really important point. NYSEF has had the advantage of being fueled by private philanthropy. Um, this is the most nimble funding that you could possibly have, and it really has allowed us to accelerate turning uh, basic research into medicine for people as quickly as we possibly can. The hallmark of everything that we do at NYSEF is innovation, and it is innovation 
that is really unbridled by the kind of uh, bureaucracy uh, or, um, or bottlenecks that you find in typical uh, funding models or in a typical institution. So we're able to combine computer engineering, hardware engineering, uh, very advanced biology, um, gene editing, to create incredible new approaches to understanding why people are getting sick, figuring out what it is that we, we have to actually fix, um, and then applying ourselves. So in some cases, it could be uh, simply not having uh, the ability to look at a very large number of patients. Um, we can do that through uh, unique technology so that we can do it with robots. And you don't have that in an individual university lab. So we work very closely with the major universities that are all doing stem cell research to um, amplify uh, the work that's being done to really scale it. Every time I talk to you, I, I, I'm so inspired uh, by everything you teach me, and it makes the mind just go in a million different directions. So thank you for that, and, and congratulations on everything that you've built at NICIF. And also thank you for a great evening to celebrate this exciting research tonight. Thank you so much, Sanjay. I'm incredibly grateful uh, to you for joining us uh, tonight, and I'm really delighted to be celebrating our stem cell heroes, Susan and Stephen Schur, Victor Garber, and the scientists whose research led to the COVID vaccines, Derek Rossi, Kismekia Corbett, Barney Graham, Catalan Carrico, and Drew Weissman. I also want to thank our supporters and all of you for joining us tonight. Let's get started. <laughs> Oh my heavens! <gasps> Scott, you're just in time. I believe I'm on the brink of a major discovery. Tony Award winner and five-time Emmy nominee Jane Krakowski? <laughs> Thank you. What are you doing here? Oh, it's called science, Scott. I know tonight's our big gala, so I just wanted to make sure everything was in order before the money people start poking their noses into our work. Oh, I, I think we're good. And not to be a buzzkill, but I think you need a little bit more training on this microscope. Perhaps you forgot, Scott, but master scientist genius Dr. Dan trained me exactly one year ago tonight over Zoom. And I've just discovered that I can make something that's very small appear very large just by peering into this device. I think you might need a little bit more training. Let's step slowly away from the microscope and I'll tell you a little bit more about the work that we've been doing. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds great. Ready. Okay. So you might remember that the type of stem cells that we study here at NYSA, we make from your skin or blood. Wait, you're making stem cells from my skin and blood? Well, not your skin and blood in particular, other people's skin and blood. Oh, that's a relief. I was gonna have to get my agent involved. So we make stem cells from a donor's skin and blood, and we can turn those stem cells into any cell type in the body, brain cells or heart cells or any type of cell. Of course, I knew that. So if you look over here, mm -hmm. we have beating heart cells that we made from somebody else's stem cells. And these heart cells beat with the same rhythm of the patient from whom we took the stem cells. So we can use these cells to study different cardiac diseases just by looking at them in the dish. And we might also be able to transplant these cells back into a patient or develop new drugs and new therapies. That sounds so incredible, Scott. Amazing. What can you do about fine lines? Because Hollywood can be brutal, and my agent is really very, very mean. Wrinkles are not a current focus of our, our work here, um, but we do study other age-related concerns. Uh, for example, we're developing a therapy for macular degeneration. It's uh, age-related blindness. Okay, that sounds equally important. Yes, so we have a special facility which we make the specific cells from the stem cells that are degenerating in the eye of a person with macular degeneration. Um, so we want to transplant these new cells back into the patient. And we hope to start a clinical trial to do this early next year. And we're really optimistic about the chances for success. That truly sounds incredible. Thank you so much. Well, Scott, we continue to amaze each other with our work. Now I really must get back to the party. What party? The in-person STEMI, Scott. The big gala. The party that combines my two greatest passions, science and posing for photographers and designer clothing. Jane, I don't know how to tell you this, but the gala is remote this year. I'm sorry, what? No, if the gala was off, why would there be a valet downstairs? There's not. Well, well then who's the guy I just gave my car keys to? I don't know. That dress adds a lot of sparkle to the lab. 
Oh, that's so sweet of you, Scott. Thank you. The sparkle is from the inside. Thank you. Continue to amaze us with your work, and thank you for all that you do. And if you ever need any help around here, I'll do it for scale. Thank you, and we hope to see you again next year. Oh, sure. Let's go find some photographers, honey. Hello, I'm Nathan Lane. What a wonderful way to kick off this evening, celebrating our stem cell heroes, Stephen and Susan Scher, the scientists behind the COVID vaccines, and my dear friend, the sensational Victor Garber. Victor has always been a hero to me, not only as a loyal, loving, and devoted friend, but as a brilliant actor and colleague. Not to mention his tremendous work on behalf of diabetes and the Alzheimer's Foundation. As we just learned, stem cells being developed at NICIF may soon be used to treat blindness and so many other conditions. And if they can do anything for bloating, I'd like them to get in touch with me. Tonight, we are going to learn how at NICIF, researchers use stem cells to better understand and advance new therapies for diseases. And on the screen right now, there is information for how you can show your support for this research. Funds raised tonight are going right to work, so please be as generous as you can. Thank you. Diseases of the brain, such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, they affect millions of people worldwide. They have this devastating impact, not only on the patients, but their families as well. I've seen this firsthand. While each disease has its own unique set of risk factors, genetic influences, and even presentation in patients, most brain diseases share the fact that there are not really any disease-modifying treatments. In the past year, NICEF scientists have developed new stem cell-based tools to study these diseases in a dish, in the pursuit of better understanding them and finding new treatments. So let's now hear about this work from Emmy and Tony award-winning actor Tony Shaloub and NICEF's Dr. Valentina Fassati, who when diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, set out to research her own disease. Hi, Valentina. So nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to learning about the research that you do. Very excited to meet you today. And yeah, I've been at NICEF for 10 years, and uh, when I came, uh, I was very determined to work on multiple sclerosis uh, because that followed a, a diagnosis that I just had uh, at that time. And, and you know, the, the big problem is, is that we, we didn't have the tools to really study the cells in the brain that get damaged. What specifically do you mean by not having the tools? I cannot ask a patient, uh, can you donate me a little piece of your brain? I don't think that many people would do that. <laughs> so we need to look at the human cells. The stem cell uh, research uh, completely changed the field. Uh, so I work on these recipes that we call protocols to make all the different cell types in the brain. We can make them in a dish. But in the past uh, two, three years, we also learned to combine them all together in uh, three-dimensional structures that we call organoid. And basically those are really micro, you know, reconstruction of what, you know, the brain cells would be like in a, in a real brain live. You basically have uh, helped to create a window into the human brain and into the cells that make up the brain. Is that right? In order to, in order to study these specific diseases, correct? Yeah, that's exactly how it is. Like we see it, it's really a window inside the brain. The cells that you're making up in the laboratory, they are accurately uh, representing the cells that make up the brain, right? Yes, yes, it's exactly right. We got really more and more sophisticated tools. So, for example, uh, NICEF, uh, in collaboration with a, a group at Harvard, just published a, a very cool paper uh, where we show that we, um, we made a, a stem cell lines from over 50 individuals. And those individuals were priests and nuns that many decades ago agreed to donate their entire body to the science. So they've been followed through their whole life uh, for looking for dementia and signs of Alzheimer's. So they donated their brain to science. And so we have almost ev basically everything from them. They have the clinical data. We knew you know, when they got Alzheimer's, when they stopped. We have imaging. 
that we, we made the cells of the brain and we can find that there is a strict correlation with what was their, uh, um, their diagnosis of Alzheimer and what we see in the dish. So you can imagine how many more studies now we will be able to do and also many other labs across the world. It's just so unbelievably interesting. And actually, my lab has been focusing on uh, on understanding why the neurons lies in a mass in Alzheimer, uh, and we we found that uh, uh, there are other type of cells in the brain that are called glia, and usually these cells are there in in our brain. They are supporting the neurons. They are making them uh, happy and healthy. But in diseases, they are really killers. So they are literally killing the neurons. And so my group uh, uh, recently showed with uh, other collaborators that. Uh, one type of these glia cells uh, that is called astrocytes, they are releasing a toxic that kills the neuron. Now that you kind of understand what's happening, how do you go about actually fixing the damage that, that has occurred? What we can do now is how can we stop this? How can we prevent this to happen? So we are using the cells and testing drugs uh, to see you know, how we are able to keep the neurons alive. Uh, this is really a completely new way to, to understand and to address all these uh, brain diseases. Not only is it is fascinating and mind-blowing, but it's, it's incredibly moving, too, it, it's, to hear this, because there's so many of us that have, uh, have had these experiences with, with family members, with friends that have suffered from this, these diseases. I feel very optimistic that this ways will lead to, to some new treatments. And so I think this is a, a very exciting uh, time to be in this type of research and it's also very exciting times for the patients that things will change. Thank you so much for sharing your, your, your work, your brilliance. Uh, I want to wish you the best of luck with everything. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Hayes. Um, just wanted to let you know a little bit about my mom. My mom was such a light in everyone's world who dedicated her life to helping those in need. In 2018, she passed away from Alzheimer's disease and I saw firsthand the devastating toll this disease takes on the patient and their caregivers. I know um, it was a trying time for each one of the members of my family as we each took turns uh, caring for uh, the mom that we loved so much. As you just heard, scientists at the NYSIF Research Institute have made tremendous progress into better understanding what may be going on in the brains of patients with diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. I hope that you will join me in supporting this critically important work so together we can give millions of families the most amazing gift of all, more time with their loved ones. Please support this work if you can. No amount is too small. Good evening. I'm Michael Scherr, and I'm thrilled to be here tonight to introduce my parents, Susan and Stephen Scherr. Anyone who has worked with them knows how incredible they are. Their generosity spans many fronts and is an example to myself, as well as others, of how to live a life with purpose. Tonight, they're being honored for their generosity to the New York Stem Cell Foundation. They've always pushed themselves and those around them to think about their impact on the world in an outsized way. You are smart, caring, and determined to make the world a better place. So mom and dad, on behalf of myself, Charles, William, and Caroline, we want to congratulate you on your well-deserved recognition as stem cell heroes. So we have four children, and our third son was diagnosed with leukemia when he was three years old. You know, William seemed rather lethargic and not well, and the diagnosis was almost immediate. You know, it hits you rather hard. He's 23 and completely cured, but we saw firsthand how uh, a disease impacts a, a child, a family. While our family was uh, touched by cancer with a phenomenally positive outcome, that's obviously not the outcome uh, for everyone. We have put our efforts, our philanthropic efforts, into causes that can help give people hope and cures and research and advocacy. Both Susan and I felt that 
it was our job okay. to commit what we could, both in terms of our time and our resources, you know, to facilitate the work of NICIF and other organizations that, you know, work toward the uh, solutions and cures. We've been involved with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Children's Cause for Cancer Advocacy, the Aslan Project, all causes that give hope to pediatric cancer patients. About 12 years ago, we were invited to NICEF and we saw firsthand the brilliance of these scientists and the work that they do. The science is enormously compelling and it didn't take long to convince either one of us that our family getting involved in NICEF was, was an easy decision you know, to make. NICEF is in a unique spot where they haven't chosen a particular disease to focus on, but rather on a methodology around stem cells that can prove a cure for any number of different diseases. For a long time, diseases have been addressed with kind of broad-based medicine. And I think the progress that NICEF and other organizations are making is that medicine is becoming far more tailored, right, to the particulars of a disease. The distinguishing feature of NICEF, even relative to those organizations that we're otherwise committed to, is that it's more than hope. and It, it is, in practice, uh, very real cures and solutions to diseases that for many, many years spell the end of an individual's life. Our willingness to be honored by the organization was really born of a desire to have uh, a wider circle of people come to an understanding of the success and the challenges that NICEF is both meeting and, and achieving. We are very humbled and honored to be recognized as NICEF stem cell heroes and are grateful that we can support this incredible organization. On behalf of the board and everyone at NICEF, I want to thank you, Susan and Stephen, for your leadership and support as we tackle finding better treatments and cures for patients. Your strategic partnership gracious hospitality and thoughtful advocacy for our vital work enable us to continue moving forward as quickly as possible. We are grateful to have you as invaluable colleagues on our board and leadership council. Steve, I know you have other things to do, including being CFO of that small company downtown, uh, but we do appreciate everything you're doing for us. It's my pleasure and an honor to congratulate you both this evening. I also want to congratulate tonight's other honorees, Victor Garber and these incredible scientists whose research is helping to lead us out of the pandemic. I'd especially like to recognize you, Derek. We are so proud to have funded your research 10 years ago in our inaugural class of NICEF Robertson investigators and to now have you as a fellow member of the NICEF board. We are grateful to you for your expertise, perspective, and support as NICEF enters the next phase of bringing the most promising science from bench to bedside. Hello, everybody. I am so happy to show up for science with you and the New York Stem Cell Foundation and to hear about the tremendous progress that they're making in research in cancer and so many other illnesses. All of our lives have been touched by disease, my family and mine included, and I'm delighted to be here and to help raise awareness and support this vital research that will enable us and our children to live longer and healthier lives. Thank you to the researchers for your tireless work and to all of you watching. Thank you for joining tonight and for your support in making this research possible. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome back my friend Tony Award winning actor Annalee Ashford, and my sort of friend we've met, but we're not really friends yet, Santino Fontana. Have a great evening. Copy, paste, E equals MC squared. Now let's push this code to the robots. Hey, 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 Annalee. What's up, sorry I'm late. Oh, be right with you, dear. I'm just, um, I'm finishing some coding. Dear? What are you, I thought we were catching, Never mind. Uh, I am done. Woo! 
Hi, Santino. How you doing? I'm good. C Cody, why are you wearing that lab coat? I'm afraid to ask. Well, I am. Uh, I'm actually Nicef's <clears throat> newest software engineer. Clearly. So wait, hold on. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let me get this straight. Last year, not only did you become an astronaut studying stem cells, but now this year you're a software programmer uh, yeah okay i have to tell you everything it's really funny nice if obviously saw our conversation from last year and they were like wow she is so smart which obviously yeah look at me and the glasses every time i see people in glasses smart first thing i think and bad eyes that's a second keep going so they asked for my help with a little trouble they were having with some robots, <clears throat> you know, sometimes they can really act like two-year-olds, those robots. Are we really doing this again? Okay, fine. So tell me, what exactly are you doing for NICEF? Oh my God. Um, well, actually, let me, let me go backwards. Do you know why we have these robots? I absolutely do not know. Okay, okay, let me tell you. Let me explain this to you, Santino, because I am a coder and I'm wearing a lab coat. We created robots to make lots and lots of stem cells. Wow, robots. That's very cool, but why do you need so many stem cells? Oh, Santino, Santino, Santino. Well, it's one thing to study a few people's cells at a time, but how do we know if that discovery will be the same in everyone? If we want to ask really big scientific questions, then we need the robots so we can study the stem cells from lots of people to know if something that is true in one person is the same for everyone. You know, I know, we all know that these diseases that we study, they are different in different people. Right, okay. And then well, how do you take that and then so 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 wait wait a second do you want to see what i've been working on all day i don't think i have a choice okay file save and play scientists drop your pipettes it's time for a break this thursday at 9 30 p.m tune into the season premiere of be positive starring Annalie ashford on cbs comma and american crime story impeachment where she plays paula jones tuesdays on fx robot <laughs> Thanks for the plug. Wow. Your talents never cease to amaze me, Emily. You've done more in this pandemic than anyone I know. I couldn't even put pants on. Dare I ask, what will your next specialty be? You know what they say. Biologists have more fun. Yes, so much fun. I will miss Taco Tuesdays with you. Oh my, I'm gonna miss you too. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, robot. Thank you, Santino. I'm a big fan. Now, let's head back to NICEF, where we will learn from Bob Balaban and NICEF's Dr. Daniel Paul about what's really going on with these robots. Hi, Dr. Paul. Hi, Bob. Welcome to the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Yes, I'm here. Happy to have you here. I see no cells. You see no cells yet. We'll definitely find you some in a moment. What you do see, though, is this incredible robotic platform that we've built here. It looks like it's looking at us. I feel that way all of the time. Wow. <laughs> the advantage of having the robots here is that we can make stem cells from hundreds of people at the same time. And we've built a lot of technology into this, including artificial intelligence. Because if people did it, it would take 100 years. It would take a very long time, and people don't always do things the same way. And robots, once you program them, don't make mistakes. Exactly. They do the same thing the same way every time. It's great to watch. They're pretty fascinating. So the reason why we wanted to build these big robotic platforms that you see here is that if you only study the cells of two or five different people, that doesn't capture the variability that exists between you, know, you and I and two or five different people. By having the robots, it allows us to study hundreds of people at the same time. And this is incredibly unique to what we have built here. Wow. So an example for this, we've recently been working with the lab of Francis Collins at the NIH, the director of the NIH, uh, to uh, develop uh, beta cells like the ones you find in your pancreas to study type 2 diabetes. And so we're working with his lab to study diabetes and gain better understanding of how different people's genetics inform the development of that disease. 
No one else in the world is doing this kind of science in the way we are right now. There are people that have robotic instruments and there are people that are approaching things in similar ways, but at the scale that we're working, we're, we're the only ones doing this. How's it going? Are you, are you finding solutions? Yeah, absolutely. So while making the cells is really important for studying disease, what we actually want to do is be able to find new therapies for treating these diseases. So we've been working with Parkinson's in particular, uh, and actually this image has been very important in this work. And so we can see this beautiful this image. This image over here? Yeah, you can see this beautiful image on the screen are, over are here. Are those mitochondrial cells? <laughs> That's a, very good. Someone's done their homework. Uh, so we no, I actually just <laughs> thought of that. Uh, so actually what you're seeing here are your skin cells. This is what your skin looks like if it's magnified. By taking many, many pictures, tens of thousands of images, we've been able to actually train an artificial intelligence model that can tell the difference between those cells that came from a healthy person and those cells that came from a Parkinson's patient. And that's the first time in the world that anyone's been able to do this. Can you tell from looking at those cells from here if they're healthy or not healthy? I couldn't tell you. The AI, the artificial intelligence, that can, and that's what makes this remarkable. But no, I cannot by, by just looking at it. Yeah, me neither. No, <laughs> I don't think anybody can. <laughs> uh, it's okay, it's not just you. <laughs> can, the, can the artificial intelligence combined with robotics come up with cures? Yes, absolutely. What we're doing now is putting drugs onto these cells, and can we trick the computer so no longer can it tell the difference between who is healthy and who is sick? If the drug is there, maybe everybody looks healthy. And if we find a drug that, according to the AI, makes the disease cells look healthy again, that's a drug we might want to be able to test in humans. Wow. That's it. So we've done this uh, in a number of different diseases. We've started in Parkinson's. We're looking to do this in multiple sclerosis at the moment, and also in a rare disease called infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy. And you couldn't do it without the robotics or without the AI? Uh, precisely. Truly, really interesting. Uh, I'm, glad you, uh, I'm glad you got to see this. It's, as I said, it's a pretty remarkable setup. There aren't too many places that, that look like this. It's and like so. being in the movie 2001, only now it's 2090. Well, there we go. We are trying to most definitely push technology forward here. So thank you again for coming. Just before the pandemic, I got a chance to visit the NYSEF Research Institute and was pretty blown away by the technology, some of which you just saw. Uh, robotic arms programmed to move cells in and out of incubators and microscopes, and to carry out experiments autonomously and with unprecedented precision. You know, NYSEF developed a lot of this technology to enable and advance experiments that otherwise might not be possible, not possible without the automation of it all. And they're making extraordinary progress in this area. They created these technologies to accelerate the process of finding new therapies for patients. You know that. Mm -hmm. But you too can contribute to that speed by supporting NYSEF. As you can imagine, this sort of large-scale research is expensive. So I do hope you'll consider making some sort of donation today to accelerate their work, which may then help to advance the entire field. Go to nysef.org slash donate, add your name to this evening's scroll of generous supporters who are showing up for science. Well, you know, I have to do this. Um thing from my friend Victor Garber. He's getting this amazing award. You know, he's no joke. I don't know if you've met or run into Victor, but there's nobody better than him. He's a fabulous actor, a fabulous friend, and a, just a monumental person, you know? And so I want to say something that's meaningful about him, that, you know, he and I have had crazy discussions about wonderful things, and he's made my brain expand. He is working on so many different levels of thought that it's great, you know, and as a, I learned a lot about diabetes and what it does to the body, because I asked Victor a lot of questions. He's just extraordinary, and I, I love him so much, I just really want to make sure I say something smart. Well, maybe if I take all the rolls out of my head or something, I'll get smarter, but we'll find out. I just, uh, but first, you know what I would say first, I love you so much, it's not even funny. Congratulations. I'm delighted to be here this evening to recognize the tremendous work being done by the New York Stem Cell Foundation and to celebrate tonight's stem cell heroes, including my own dearest friend, Victor Garber. Victor, this is so cool. You're totally a science nerd now. 20 years ago, you played my dad and boy, did that role ever stick. You can't shake me. You are the funniest, most compassionate, most full of integrity, most talented, 
handsome, most handsome, and thin. You are so thin. Are you doing Pilates? You're all of these things and the most of them of any person I know. I am proud of you and I love you so, my spy daddy. You've had to deal with challenges people might not realize. You've lived with diabetes now for so many years, I won't say the actual number, but people with math skills, three scores of living with type one diabetes. You, Nathan and Lisa, have watched as Alzheimer's disease took both of your parents. And you, Victor, have used these challenges to give a voice to those who don't have one. You've been an incredible advocate for these communities of patients and caregivers to help bring more funding to research like we're hearing about tonight so that one day there will be a cure for these diseases. Maybe they won't exist at all. There is no one more deserving of this honor than you. You've done so much to make the world and my family <laughs> a better place and a happier place. I love you so very much. Congratulations. It's so baffling to me to think of this sort of uh, war on science that's been going on in the last couple of years. I don't understand it, and I, I don't think I ever will, because, um, you know, I am, I'm alive because of science. I keep thinking I was 11, but I think I was closer to 12. I started having these very severe symptoms, the symptoms for type 1 diabetes. And I was uh, sent to the hospital that night. From that day on, uh, I was on insulin, of course. For a long time, I kind of pretended I, that that wasn't an issue. But in the theater, everyone knew, especially as, as I got older. I kind of got smarter and, and realized that people had to know in case something went wrong. Hi, I'm Victor Garber, and I've had type 1 diabetes since I was 12. And I'm Kristen, and I've had diabetes since I was 5. As you can see, type 1 diabetes afflicts the young. I've been active trying to be uh, publicly out about type 1 diabetes. It's imperative that Congress provides a long-term renewal of the program, which will ensure that critical research can continue unimpeded and enable more life-changing breakthroughs for the children you see here today. It just makes me crazy to think of what those mothers have to go through, not just the people with it. I've been with Reiner and Driesen for over 20 years. He's an artist, a painter, specializing in portraits. He's my rock, literally. We were together when Alias happened, and we moved into a house in LA, and then he was suddenly, you know, he had, was living with a type one diabetic, and my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She was living in Los Angeles on her own, and we suddenly realized this, there's this something wrong. So it was actually amazing that I was cast in Alias. My next doctor's appointment's in a few weeks. Would you go with me? Sweetheart, of course I will. I'm sure it was divine intervention because there was no reason for me to be in LA other than I got this job. That's what I used the money for, to have a, uh, have a, a caregiver with her at all times. There's no disease that isn't cruel, but Alzheimer's is brutal. I used to walk in end-to-end -end Alzheimer's. The cast of Alias, would, we'd all do it. We'd all be there and take our picture and, you know, wave banners and everything. I'm just grateful to be a minor voice to support organizations like New York Stem Cell Foundation. I wanted people to know more about this organization and what you are doing. I think it's the basis for all health issues, or certainly things like Alzheimer's and macular degeneration and type 1 diabetes. This is important that we pour all our attention into this form of research. You are the future. You are the hope. Please, I'm, I'm counting on you. Hey, it's Alec Baldwin here. Congratulations to the great Victor Garber. Great on stage, great on TV, great in the movies, and great as an advocate for stem cell research. Victor, I love you. I love your talent. 
and congratulations on your much deserved honor. Congratulations to my dear friend Victor Garber and tonight's other honorees for your much deserved awards. Victor, you are a tremendous advocate for the diabetes and Alzheimer's communities and have done so much to inspire so many, including me, to share their stories and join in the fight to find cures. And in doing so, you have made this world a much better place. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce an inspiring young woman who turned her own diagnosis as a child into a career focused on finding better treatments for patients. Today, she is a scientist at the NYSEF Research Institute working on the very disease that she lives with. I remember exactly it was seven days before my 10th birthday that I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The doctor said, here's a syringe and then you have to inject yourself whenever you're eating or whenever you're drinking. You have to control your blood sugar. And I just could not imagine how it is to do that for the rest of my life. In the beginning, I didn't tell any of my friends, but I just wanted to be normal. My doctor started very early telling me about what could happen. I think I was like 18 or 19 years old, and the eye doctor said, your eyes don't look so good. And that scared me really, really, really. There is a good amount of, of science and research that says it's an autoimmune disease, so your own immune cells would attack your better cells, which are located in the pancreas, which usually produce the insulin that you need to, you know, bring the sugar out of your blood system into your cells. That's which one? And so basically with type 1 diabetes, you don't have these cells anymore. They are completely destroyed by your own immune system and therefore you basically need to give your insulin from outside. So right now I have a pump and a, a continuous glucose, glucose measuring device. Nobody in my family is a scientist. Nobody in my family ever went to university. But the fact that I had type 1 diabetes made me really curious. And so when I was I think 13 or 14, I started actually digging into my first publications and looking for some evidence of, of what scientists are doing to actually heal or cure this disease. When it comes to what I believe is the probably best path or potentially the most successful path to, to get closer to cure type 1 diabetes, it's probably cell therapy. It's probably a, finding a way to put back your cells. And so for type 1 diabetes in particular, we here at NYSEF um, work on making pancreatic organoids that can produce insulin and that can be stimulated with, with glucose and then secrete insulin. The good thing with stem cell therapy is you could potentially take cells, you reprogram them into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then you differentiate them into pancreatic organoids. And eventually you could transplant them. Usually what happens if I would give you my cells, right, they would be rejected because your immune system, you know, realizes that's not the cell that belongs here. So I'm trying to overexpress some, some of the genes that we believe could help to evade the immune system. And with a team of other scientists doing the gene editing, so I'm modifying the, the cells in a way that we think it could work. all these cells that are red. We know that they have the gene overexpressed. And so what we try right now is to select to have only the red ones left over. The field is, you know, accelerating and this at some point I'm very sure will lead to a, a really successful cell therapy either for type 1 diabetes or other diseases. I'm super optimistic. I'm, I mean, that's why I'm working here. <laughs> Good evening. I am so delighted to be with NYSIF and all of you this evening and to see the incredible work that NYSIF is doing. I remember having Susan and her scientists on my television show when she was just getting this organization off the ground. You could already see then 
that NICIF and the relatively young field of stem cell research held so much promise. Now I love coming to the NICIF Gala and Science Fair every year to learn more about the latest research progress that they are making towards the solutions that we need for our loved ones. Scientists like Dr. Wesley are a shining light on the hope and opportunity for our futures through science. Science that may one day lead to a cure for diabetes patients like Dr. Wesley and so many others. But we need your help to allow these researchers to succeed in making this hope a reality. I have supported NISA from the very beginning, and I hope that you will too. Join me in supporting NISIF this year. Every donation, big and small, will go directly toward their pioneering research and development on the major diseases of our time. I challenge all of us to be a part of shaping a healthier future. Thank you very much. Every year in the United States, over 100,000 women are diagnosed with reproductive cancers. Over 32,000 women die annually from these cancers. The standard of care has changed very little over the past several decades, and we need new tools to improve outcomes for women diagnosed with these diseases. The NICEF Women's Reproductive Cancers Initiative aims to shift paradigms in the way these cancers are studied and the way they are treated. Leveraging its world-leading expertise in stem cell technology, this particular NICEF initiative is creating innovative and personalized models of cancer to try and find more effective treatments. So let's hear more from NICEF's Dr. Laura Andres Martin and award-winning actor and director, Jesse Williams. Good morning, doctor. It's wonderful to, to meet you. Uh, I've been reading a lot about your work, trying to understand as much as possible. So I'd love to learn kind of directly from you about the research process and also where your benchmarks are for progress. Like what is the ultimate goal that you set? Well, thank you so much for, for your time here. Uh, yeah, what focus is in ovarian cancer specifically because, um, you know, after so many decades of good things happening in science for cancer research and treatments, uh, for these patients, survival rates are very low. Um, still, there is no new treatments. There is nothing really new out there. So we saw there was this gap in the research and our goal is really to try to understand the disease better. We wanna find new treatments and more specifically make them personalized. Uh, this disease is very heterogeneous. Each patient is different and what works for patient A is not going to work for patient B. So we're trying to really personalize treatments so that we hopefully can you know, improve the survival rates that are really, really low. Well, there's so many different kinds of patients, of course, right, with different makeups. So how could you possibly test or sample those drugs uh, without testing them on that patient first if there's so much variation? Yeah, that's actually, imagine that you test the patient without having the patient. That's what we do. Uh, mm -hmm. So we get tumor samples uh, from patients, specifically on the day of the surgery. They send it to our labs. And then we are using this technology that is called tumor-derived organoids um, that allow us to literally grow the tumor in the laboratory. And that tumor grows similarly to how it grows in the patient. So it really established this personalized model for that specific patient. And we can grow them up, we can study them, and we can try treatments and drugs, either the ones that are being used currently, or we can try other drugs that are like being in development or new therapeutic strategies, which a patient will never have the opportunity to try all these combinations or different treatments. Wow, hold on. So you can take a tumor out of a body and then continue to grow that tumor independent of the body to be able to do testing exactly. on it? Exactly, that's exactly what wow. we do. Wow, I've, I've been a fake doctor for over a decade and I, I didn't <laughs> know that. So this is, uh, this is news to me. Um, it's really, really incredible. So what, what happens once you feel like you're making progress uh, in that testing phase, how do you implement that? directly into a, a new patient who's just walked in the door? Yeah, so as of now, the first part of the research was to implement the technology. We had done that. Then we needed to develop a test to see which specific drugs will kill each patient tumors. And we had done that too. 
our next steps are to expand that and to make it reproducible across all kinds of patients and all patient types. Uh, so that's what we are going to be doing within the next few months. And then this drug testing needs to be approved by regulatory agencies. Well, uh, it's absolutely incredible the work that you're doing and to hear about the progress that you're making and the choice that you've made to dive into something that you saw was not was not improving as fast as you would like. So uh, I look forward to the day that these tests are approved for, for our patients. And um, we just thank you so much for your work and for, for sharing this information with us today. The work leading to today's mRNA vaccines has been quietly building for decades. And it's really wonderful to see these fantastic scientists now getting the well-deserved recognition for not just the historic achievement of developing COVID-19 vaccines, but also for those decades of work that led us to this moment. The COVID-19 pandemic is a tremendous challenge to humanity. We know that. We know that these past 18 to 22 months have shown us the best tools we have to usher us out of the current pandemic and other future unknowns are science and technology. Warm greetings to you all. My name is Tony Fauci here at NIH, and it gives me great pleasure to join my colleagues to honor a remarkable group of scientists for their contributions to the highly effective mRNA vaccines and the creative immunogen design now being deployed to quell the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, the development of COVID-19 vaccines leveraging a novel mRNA platform in less than one year was an extraordinary feat, unprecedented in the annals of science. Seminal to this remarkable accomplishment was work from a group of outstanding scientists, including Drs. Catalin Carrico, Drew Weissman, Barney Graham, Kazmikia Corbett, and Derek Rossi. Their efforts underpinned the development and advancement of groundbreaking mRNA technology from a promising concept to real-world life-saving interventions. This technology has not only altered the trajectory of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it has also transformed our understanding of this powerful platform technology that may bolster and support future public health efforts. And so, congratulations to these extraordinary scientists for their critical contributions that led to the development of COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, giving hope to the world that we will end the COVID-19 pandemic and ushering in an even broader era of mRNA-based vaccines and therapeutics. Dangerous virus is spreading rapidly. In late 2019, something troubling was happening. This pandemic. China has identified the cause. A new and lethal respiratory virus had emerged in China that was sickening thousands. A ninth person has tested positive for coronavirus. By early 2020, the entire world was engulfed in a pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the coronavirus outbreak. That to date has already killed close to 5 million people. The journey from pandemic to vaccine that we witnessed over the past 18 months has been extraordinary. The story of how the vaccine was developed in less than a year is actually the culmination of decades of research. It depends on which story you want. If you want the 40-year story or the one year. We actually started working on vaccines a long time ago. Uh, we never stopped working on vaccines. So many scientists, hundreds, were thousands of scientists who came before us. They, they did so much that it could happen. To understand how we get to the mRNA vaccines, we must first understand the relationship between DNA, mRNA, and protein. I think most people on planet Earth have heard the term DNA. Essentially, everybody knows that it contains the code of life. But what people don't realize, actually, is that it's, DNA is actually a rather passive molecule. Sure, the whole code of life is contained on DNA, but the effector molecules that do the busy work of the cell are actually proteins. So what's the relationship between DNA and proteins? Well, DNA lives in the nucleus, proteins are synthesized in the cytoplasm, 
and there's a necessary and obligate intermediate molecule that carries the code from DNA out to the cytoplasm to enable proteins to be made. That's mRNA. I like to say you think about a messenger or mRNA as like a Snapchat message for your cells. So it is a way to send a very quick message that your cells can read and it doesn't last forever. You can't come back to it in a couple of days and see anything, but the lasting effects of what your cells read is there, and that is the protein. I started to work with RNA in Hungary as a graduate student and, uh, at uh, 1989 when I started work at University of Pennsylvania. I uh, made messenger RNA. Uh, at the NIH, I was in Tony Fauci's lab and I worked on dendritic cells. And when I got to Penn, I was interested in working on vaccines. It was 1997, 98, and he was there. The new guy came from uh, Fauci's lab. I mentioned that I'm working with RNA and I would be glad to make RNA for him. And that's what we did. When Katie and I started working on RNA, we thought that it would be very beneficial it would be safer, easier, less expensive, and better for lots of different therapeutics, including vaccines. So as Drew and Katy were working on mRNA in the early years, they found that the mRNA they were making was toxic to cells and mice that they were testing it on. So we identified how to avoid that, how to alter the RNA so it no longer made mice sick and no longer induced inflammation and we could start using it as a therapeutic. It was kind of a dream comes true. We can make an RNA, which is non-immunogenic. What I said to Katie was, our phones are gonna ring off the hook because we, we've figured out how to use RNA as a therapeutic. It didn't happen. We knew that it had enormous potential to change medicine in the future, but nobody was interested. In 2010, everything uh, changed. My lab's entree to this story started at a stem cell conference in Toronto, Canada in 2005, when I first heard Shinya Yamanaka describe his discovery detailing how he was able to turn human skin cells into pluripotent stem cells. Two years after this, I started my lab at Harvard Medical School, and along with a fellow in my lab, we wondered if we could use mRNA to reprogram human cells instead of using the retroviruses that Yamanaka had. The retroviruses actually integrate into the DNA. So the transient nature of mRNA was the appeal for using it for making induced pluripotent stem cells. In 2010, my group published a paper showing that we could successfully reprogram stem cells using mRNA. And at that point, I applied for a grant from the New York Stem Cell Foundation. They, <laughs> in their wisdom, saw the immense potential of this work and I received the grant. I was one of the initial Robertson investigators. Also in 2010, I started a company called Moderna with the goal of developing mRNA therapeutics. In 2000, the NIH opened the Vaccine Research Center. Barney Graham was a founding investigator and oversaw the development of vaccine products. I started working with Dr. Barney Graham at the National Institutes of Health actually when I was 19 years old and I came back after getting my PhD, and, and that's when our coronavirus work started. The first SARS and then the avian flu in 2005, and then swine flu in 2009, and then MERS, and then chikungunya, and then Ebola in 2014, then it just kept coming. We understood what the necessity was, and we understood the level of tenderness that it might take to prepare um, a vaccine response in case of a pandemic. And then after the big Zika uh, event in 2016, we worked with Moderna on an mRNA vaccine. So vaccines are based on the idea of training the immune system to block a virus. In 2013, Graham and his colleagues made an important discovery that laid the groundwork for all of the COVID-19 vaccines. We're able to stabilize the F protein of RSV in that pre-fusion form. It became a much, much better vaccine antigen. By 2020, when the pandemic emerged, both Moderna and BioNTech had advanced mRNA into the clinic for a large number of disease indications, including cancer. They'd also run a number of different vaccine trials, such that when the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 hit, they were ready and quickly pivoted to focus on the new and deadly threat. 
40 years of work on mRNA science was about to be put to the test. Pneumonia has hit central China's Wuhan city. Authorities have reported- On December 31st of uh, 2019, uh, there was a uh, news clip that was sent to me, uh, indicated there was an outbreak of a respiratory virus in Wuhan, China. The sequences were posted online January 10th. So we took that sequence and we were able to plug and play in the two proline mutations that we had designed in the context of MERS and, and SARS and HKU1 earlier in 2017. We were very fortunate to know what we knew and to have everybody in place to really act quickly. When we saw the types of immune responses that were being generated in those mice, it was just like, oh my God, we are generating antibody responses and not just antibody responses, but very good antibody responses. I, I still can't even believe all of that happened. <laughs> Our goal was to go just into a phase one clinical trial in collaboration with Moderna um, in 100 days. And obviously we exceeded that by 66 days. And then I got a call to let me know that, the, that it worked, the Pfizer. The Pfizer vaccine worked. The Pfizer BioNTech vaccine was almost identical to the Moderna vaccine. And is we knew that the Moderna result would be the same. 95% effective. And it's much higher than analysts had been expecting. I cried. My reaction was just happy, happy tears. So I was invited uh, to Penn to receive the vaccine with uh, Drew Weissman. I heard the clapping and I was like, I was crying even today I'm um, talking about it because I've, and this is what emotional more for me when people are emailing me and, and telling me what it meant for them to get the vaccine. And thank you very much for helping me out. That's every vaccinologist's dream is to see something they worked on actually being used and put in people's arms and see uh, the relief that it gave people. It's a fantastic thing to have our vaccine work so well and, and to save so many people's lives. I actually felt more emotion when, I, when my grandmother got the vaccine than even when I got it myself because the reason why I am a vaccinologist is because it's about other people for me. You never really know what the impact of what your science is until a society like this one just says, look, you're a hero. I feel very honored that the New York Stem Cell Foundation giving me this award. It's a great honor to us to receive this award. Now, one of the greatest joys in science is to see something for the first time that maybe nobody else has ever seen. And it's even more rare when it, it's recognized by other people. It's really a great honor for me to be here. But the one thing I always say about science is it's, it's always built on the shoulders of others. This is what we do as scientists. We try to make discoveries and sometimes we're lucky enough to have that work impact human health. What a wonderful evening. Um, to our 2021 stem cell heroes, a big congratulations again, and a, a, very, a very genuine thank you for inspiring all of us with your dedication to helping patients all over the world. As we heard tonight, NICEF's mission is to accelerate cures for the major diseases of our time through stem cell research. Envision this, potentially within our lifetime, we and certainly future generations might be able to look at multiple sclerosis, diabetes, cancer, and other chronic and degenerative conditions at the way that we view smallpox as a disease of the past. Could happen. NICEF is doing their part. They're showing up every day to make this vision a reality and maybe we should all help them get there. If you've already donated in tribute to our stem cell heroes and in support of the NYSEF Research Institute, thank you again. For everyone else, you still have time even after this program ends. I hope you also enjoyed tonight's program, highlighting NYSEF's amazing work, especially for those of you who are new to stem cell research or NYSEF. I hope you get involved. I hope you learn more. That's what I did. 
And this program featured just a fraction of the incredible progress that NYSEF researchers and collaborators are making to improve our understanding of diseases and also find ways to cure them. Uh, it's been an honor for me to join all of you in celebrating our optimism for the future of human health. Thank you for showing up for science with NYSEF tonight. Stay safe, be well.